Even by rock and roll standards, the Red Hot Chili Peppers' ride to stardom has been a wild one. Losing band members, having band members having band members quit, join, disappear, show up, take off in the middle of a tour. On good days, there's a lot of chaos in this band. Formed by a group of Hollywood high school troublemakers, the Peppers started as a joke. I think I saw the first Red Hot Chili Peppers show, which was one song and about a minute and a half long. And soon the band had a reputation for mayhem, both on and off the stage. Wherever we would go, club owners would say, you're going to do the thing with the sock tonight, right? But the mayhem had a dark side, too. The Peppers have battled drug addiction for almost as long as they've been a band. After Hillel, I was like, I don't really want to go to any more junkie funerals. If it's not working now, add heroin and cocaine, it's for sure not going to work. You know what I'm saying? But through it all, lead singer Anthony Kiedis and bass guitarist Flea Balzeri somehow managed to keep the whole thing together. Anthony had determination and charisma. Flea had charisma and discipline. Birth, death, rebirth, redemption, rinse, repeat. The hair-raising highs and lows of the Red Hot Chili Peppers. On the night of February 11th, 2007, the Red Hot Chili Peppers bounded onto the Staples Center stage at the 49th Annual Grammy Awards four times to collect the little gold statuettes. They'd been nominated for six awards, and their longtime producer, Rick Rubin, also won for Producer of the Year. The whole world got to watch the Red Hot Chili Peppers attain the ultimate greatness, you know? The funk punk band of former misfits also performed their latest hit, Snow, before the crowd of music industry luminaries. They've been around for decades, and they hadn't really gotten that much acknowledgement from the music establishment. The fact that they've been triumphant and been able to come out on the other end of all the things that they've been through and make great music is one of the greatest rock and roll stories ever. It's a story that began, fittingly, in a place that is no stranger to rock and roll legend. The hallways of West Hollywood's Fairfax High practically echo with music history. Famous former students include Warren Zevon, Phil Spector, Herb Albert, and Guns N' Roses guitarist Slash. In 1977, Anthony Kiedis, Jack Irons, and Hillel Slovak entered Fairfax as freshmen, along with a kid named Michael Balzeri, nicknamed Mike B. The Flea. No one could have imagined this awkward, unpopular group of guys would one day join the list of famous Fairfax High alumni. I guess it's a classic L.A. story more than anything else. Oh, Anthony, Flea, Hillel Slovak were all sort of crazy freak misfit skate punk music freaks in Los Angeles Anthony Kiedis was born in Michigan but moved to LA to live with his father when he was 11 and his father was a sort of wild party guy and he would take Anthony out with him you know to go out and get wasted and he was the one who introduced Anthony to drugs and had him involved in crazy sex situations very early in life some of his early drug experiences were, were in the presence of his father, which I think he thought was, was kind of a bonding experience initially, but realized later was kind of disorienting. Hillel Slovak, Jack Irons, and Michael Flea Balzeri had more conventional upbringings. Flea's stepfather played in a jazz band, and by the time Flea reached high school, he was an accomplished musician. He started playing trumpet very young. He was very into jazz and into more avant-garde music and then into punk as more of an expression of that. By the late 70s, L.A.'s punk rock scene was in full swing. Seeing the punk rock in the clubs and stuff like all up and down the Sunset Strip, it was, it was pretty wild, man, you know? The hardcore punk thing was happening as well as the post-punk thing and synth rock and there was a lot of stuff going on in that period. The boys graduated high school in 1980. By this time, Flea, Hillel, and Jack Irons had formed a band called Anthem and were playing some of LA's clubs. They, along with Anthony Kiedis, were all part of a loose bunch of friends who hung out and jammed all day and partied all night. 
you know, it was many parties where Flea would be the first to take his clothes off and jump in the swimming pool naked, and I'd jump right behind him. Yeah, it's, cr it's crazy. You know? <laughs> there were many parties where that was the case. Lots of getting naked. There were also lots of drugs. These guys were living in a house together in California, in this little house. And they were getting really messed up all the time. And they were not paying their rent. So the woman who owned the house took the doors off the house. The guys were so messed up at the time, they lived in the house for two more months with no doors on it. They actually li continued to live in the house. Till finally one day they said, hey man, there's no doors on this house. Maybe we should get out of here. For the first few years out of high school, the guys just drifted around L.A. and West Hollywood, staying with girlfriends or crashing on couches. About the only constant was the bond between Flea and Anthony. We go out to a club or a party, we would see them together. They were homies, you know, almost like brothers from what, you, from what, what we could see. Like minds will, will find each other, especially at that time of your life, and these guys became just stuck like glue running partners together and hanging out and skateboarding and messing around and whatever they did. And while Anthony wasn't an accomplished musician like Flea, he was a natural performer. Hey, you! This is Anthony! Anthony just wanting to be in the spotlight somehow, whatever that was going to be. And he was sort of messing around writing some raps and writing some, you know, rhymes and things. They listened to rock and they listened to punk, but there was a lot of Sly and the Family Stone, a lot of Hendrix, a lot of Stevie Wonder. Anthony especially was into funk, as well as some of the early rappers like Grandmaster Flash. But at the time, the other three were in a rock and roll band. Anthem, eventually renamed What Is This, had by the early 80s become regulars at L.A. clubs like the Troubadour, the Whiskey, and the Starwood. Anthony often DJed before their shows, and they all partied together after. In Los Angeles, there was this real blending and merging and mixing and matching of different musics. And on one fateful night in April of 1983, Anthony Kiedis was asked to join his buddies from What Is This on stage. Anthony was this wild personality. Somebody just said, hey, can you get up and do one song to get the crowd hyped at this show? You know, can you come to the club and just do this one thing to get things moving? That one song would provide the spark that would ignite one of the most highly combustible rock and roll bands in the world. Sexta, corra e garanta seu lugar no sofá. Tem Slash ao vivo no Multishow. O ex-guitarrista do Guns N' Roses não vai deixar ninguém parado no show que rola no Rio de Janeiro. Nesta sexta, nove e meia da noite, ao vivo, na TV e na web. Facts High School graduates and friends Michael Flea Balzeri, Hillel Slovak, and Jack Irons were members of an L.A. rock band called What Is This? Although he wasn't in the band, another friend from high school, Anthony Kiedis, hung out with the guys and was a regular fixture on the L.A. club scene, DJing and occasionally putting together outrageous comedy sketches with friends. He was not a musician, but he did have these guys around him who were, you know, who were musicians. Then in April of 1983, the owner of the Rhythm Lounge in L.A. asked Anthony to put together a short musical performance to get the crowd going before a show. Flea, Slovak, and Irons helped him write and perform a defunct style rap song he named Out in L.A. It was two minutes of loud, fast, outrageous punk funk mayhem, and the crowd went wild. One song and about a minute and a half long. It was an audience of about 50 people that just went berserk. They loved it. Anthony knew how to be a front man, and he knew how to be a showman, and he knew how to get everybody to watch him and just go nuts. The club owner asked him and his friends to come back when they had some more material, which they did a few weeks later. The next show was maybe three or four songs, still very short, and the, uh, there was twice as many people. They built a following very quickly. It's white punk trash. It's great. I love it. With their popularity growing, the group decided a name was in order. They chose the Red Hot Chili Peppers after the Robert Johnson song, They're Red Hot. When the Red Hot Chili Peppers first broke out and began to play around Los Angeles, 
Those shows were loose and crazy, and there was a lot of antics. They were an extremely wild live act, you know, just jumping all over the stage and into the audience, and just the loudest punk funk you could imagine. Even though nobody, including the band members themselves, actually took the band seriously, in a matter of months, they were playing in bigger clubs and had even begun to attract the attention of the local music press. We would read about the Red Hot Chili Peppers in the magazines that were hit. Like, the LA Weekly seemed to love them. And there was also, like, a local gossip column that the Chili Peppers were, like, a staple of. Every week there was a mention of what Anthony had for breakfast or uh, where Flea was seen. They were local sensations, I'd say. Flea plays the bass, he's a god. Their popularity had as much to do with their outrageous stage show as it did with their high-energy mashup of punk and funk. And even back then, Anthony Kiedis had a way with audiences. Something about what Anthony was doing was connecting with people from day one. His charisma, his personality, his delivery, his intention brought people in. And Flea's unique style of slap bass and Hillel's frantic guitar playing only contributed to the mayhem. I remember when I first saw Flea as a bass player, I thought he played like a black bass player. I thought he played as funky as any black bass player that I have seen or known. It was the combination of Hillel's guitar playing, Flea's bass playing, and Anthony's presence that really gelled their early sound. During their first summer playing together, at one particularly rowdy show at the infamous Kit Kat Lounge, the band introduced what would become one of their signatures. They just came out with socks on stage on their members. They weren't afraid to have fun, and they weren't afraid to go to the end for their performance. That's what it's all about when you're wild, crazy guys like us. In the fall of 1983, after only having performed together as a band for a little over six months, EMI Records offered the Red Hot Chili Peppers a recording contract. EMI said, well, let's play to the strength of what people are responding to on stage about these guys. There was just one problem. At around the same time, What Is This, Flea, Jack, and Hillel's other band was also offered a recording contract with MCA Records. Hillel and Jack elected to stay with What Is This a band they had been in longer and that they took much more seriously. Flea stayed with his friend Anthony. The Peppers now had a record deal, but only half a band. They needed to find a drummer and a guitar player fast. Drummer Cliff Martinez signed on almost immediately. I was in a band called The Weirdos that was one of the first L.A. punk bands that um, Flea was a fan of, so he had seen me perform. Finding a guitar player wasn't quite so easy something that would haunt the Peppers for the next two decades. We went through a couple guitar auditions in the time I was in the band, and it was like we'd have to go through 20 or 30 guys to find somebody that was even in the ballpark. Finally, they hired John Sherman, who toured with John Hyatt and Graham Parker. With the band in place, they entered the studio to record their first album. Red Hot Chili Peppers was released on August 10, 1984, and was an instant failure. It sold around 25,000 copies and disappeared. I don't remember being concerned about the, uh, the sales figures as much as how the album turned out, how the, um, the live sound of the band had been altered by the recording process. I think it was some disappointment all around for the way that the record came out. The only good news was the What Is This debut record fared even worse than the Peppers. So guitarist Hillel Slovak quit to rejoin his friends. Are you ready to funk? A year later, the Peppers released a second album. This one produced by Funkadelic legend George Clinton. It fared little better. The records were just kind of a mess. The Chili Peppers were a spectacle and an experience and really about performance and about showmanship and chaos. But the records weren't going to convince you if you hadn't seen them. It's called Freaky Styly. It's a new classic landmark of a classic monumental masterpiece of music. The Peppers, now Kiedis, Flea, Slovak and Martinez, hit the road in a beat-up van and toured the country. They would come on stage and you knew that they were there to have a great time and they were to take no prisoners. And that was the thing that I think really drew everybody into them at the time. We're still playing nightclubs and not big concert venues. 
But for me, and I think for everybody, it was like our first brush with rock and roll success and fame and everything that comes with that in a smaller amount. They had their first brushes with groupies. I don't think any of us were really adept at that. Pretty much people were like, you know, stepping over you to get to Anthony if, if there was any girl action at all. Even as the Peppers were getting their first taste of fame, their newfound success was threatened by the drug use of Anthony Kiedis and Hillel Slovak. At a gig back in L.A., towards the end of the tour, Anthony didn't even show up. Keith Morris from the Circle Jerks offered to stand in for Anthony, and he just made up words, saying whatever came into his head. So it was just kind of this constant insecurity that you would go to a show without your singer. Uh, we don't need a singer. Forget it. I can recall having talks with the different members of the Red Hot Chili Peppers about Anthony disappearing or not coming to rehearsals or missing studio sessions and there being anger behind that. Because this guy is off on a heroin binge. He's drugging it up. Tired of non-stop touring in a cramped van and the constant mayhem that seemed to follow the Chili Peppers wherever they went, Cliff Martinez left the band in the summer of 1986. I think it was a good thing because immediately afterwards, I guess, things got a lot worse on the drug front. With the band again... Jack Irons was happy to rejoin his friends. He's the yeah, original He's the original oh, he's, he's the new old one. Yeah. The Peppers were back to their original lineup and eager to take things to the next level. For their third album, the band wanted to hire the Beastie Boys' acclaimed producer, Rick Rubin. He had been involved in a lot of albums that they really respected. You know, some of the seminal hip-hop albums and obviously the Beastie Boys and all of that. But after meeting with them at the rehearsal studio, Rubin turned them down. He just felt like the energy was bad. Get the last note, man. They were deep into drug use. You know, they hadn't figured out what they wanted to be or how they wanted to get there. I think at the time that I left, the band was at a creative low point. And I think part of it, you could say, was the band had been infected by, by drug use. And I think it lowered everybody's creative output. The Peppers' third album, produced by studio veteran Michael Beanhorn, was released the following September. We just came out with our third record, the Uplift Vocal Party Plan. It is our best record to date. It could be the best record ever made by mankind. The Uplift Mofo Party Plan was the first Red Hot Chili Peppers album to crack Billboard's top 200. But it peaked at number 148, and like the first two, quickly faded from view. The records are sort of all vibe and feeling and no real songs. And that was the big challenge for them. I mean, you either bought into liking what they were about, or you didn't. Let the pookie juices dribble down your chin. Woo! The Peppers seemed to be stuck on the fringes of rock and roll success, and the rampant drug abuse was starting to block their way to the next level, and it would only get worse. On June 25th, 1988, a friend stopped by Hillel Slovak's L.A. apartment. He found the guitarist face down on the floor, dead. The victim of a heroin overdose. Uh, with the Red Hot Chili Peppers, I'm Khalil Slovet, the guitar player. That's Fleet. That's Dudley Do Right. Right. You can do no wrong. And this is Swan. On June 30th, 1988, a memorial service for Red Hot Chili Pepper guitarist Hillel Slovak was held at Mount Sinai Memorial Park in Hollywood, California. Slovak had been found dead of a heroin overdose five days earlier at the age of 26. No matter what people said about Hillel's drug use, the last thing you think is that, like, this, you know, ball of human energy is not going to be with us anymore. So it's a shock to the system. The death of Hillel really obviously losing their, one of their best friends to a heroin overdose was devastating to the guys. Conspicuously absent from the memorial service was the group's charismatic frontman, Anthony Kiedis. He had left for Mexico to get away from the L.A. drug scene and try to get himself clean. He was very well aware that that could easily have been him any that day or another day. Jack Irons, the band's drummer, took Hillel's death even harder. He suffered a complete mental breakdown. 
he flipped completely and actually ended up in a hospital for a while. And when he came back out and said, I just, I can't be in this band anymore. Once again, the Red Hot Chili Peppers were down to two members. And I think it was a very open question whether you could continue a band that was now down to two guys, one of whom doesn't play an instrument. Anthony returned from Mexico a month later, clean and sober, for now. And he and Flea were ready to put the band back together. After months of auditioning and checking out local bands, they came across 19-year-old guitarist John Frusciante, who had just joined a band called Thelonious Monster. He's a little bit younger than the others and was actually a fan of the bands. This was somebody who was going to all their shows, could play all their songs, was kind of a Chili Peppers groupie. He was this, this little kid that came through, you know, that was wide-eyed, innocent, but could play his song. He was an obvious choice for the Peppers' vacant guitar spot, and Flea and Anthony had no trouble persuading him to leave his band and sign up with them. He knew how to play the songs, he knew the material, he could fall in and immediately be up to speed. The part that I think they didn't anticipate was, above and beyond that, he was this incredibly gifted, visionary musician. But they still needed a drummer. After months of searching, the auditions had yielded little more than pounding headaches. They did open auditions for a drummer. They just put ads in the paper, and they just saw, you know, dozens and dozens and dozens of drummers. They were about to give up when Chad Smith walked through the door. And they said Chad came in looking like an 80s hair metal player with mullet and like a, a surf shirt on. And we're like, who is this knucklehead? But when he played, we're like, that's the guy. We're done. That's it. We we'll have to get him a haircut, but that's the guy who's going to play in this band. Chad, as a, as a drummer, his power, it actually truly matches the intensity of Flea's bass playing. He's like the, the hammer of Thor coming down constantly on your head in a song. He's a loud son of a... The latest iteration of the Red Hot Chili Peppers hit the road for a short tour and then headed into the studio. On August 28, 1989, the band released their fourth album, Mother's Milk. How did you guys come up with that name for that album? It just kind of describes what we're all about, you know, that sort of healthy, natural, pure essence of life type liquid substance that we like to squirt into the face of our listeners. <laughs> Mother's Milk really was the record that started to get them more of a national audience, that started to get them more of a following outside their region and sort of little pockets of people who had, had discovered them before. Much of that was due to a cover song added at the last minute to the album, a funked-up, high-energy version of Stevie Wonder's Higher Ground. Higher Ground was a perfect thing to translate what the Chili Peppers were to a bigger audience in a quick and an immediate way. Since he's written so many beautiful songs, it only makes sense that people would want to cover one of his tunes. People got it. Oh, okay. It's a Stevie Wonder song, it's, it's a funk song, but it's got this crazy rock guitar on it. So that's what these guys can do. Those are the things that they can put together. On the strength of Higher Ground, along with the second single, a tribute to Hillel called Knock Me Down, Mother's Milk became the Chili Peppers' first gold record. It was exciting for all of us. We were happy to see the Red Hot Chili Peppers begin to take off. In the meantime, the band continued its grueling touring schedule, this time playing somewhat larger venues to more enthusiastic crowds. But what gave them the most national exposure was a young cable television channel called MTV. And you're watching MTV Australia! Video was something that the Chili Peppers were born for. They were an incredibly visual band. They had always been a visual band live, and they took it to a new level when they made videos. The Chili Peppers had demonstrated a musical maturity and mainstream appeal that no one thought they were capable of. But it wouldn't be long before the band was back in crisis mode and in the market for yet another guitarist. By the summer of 1990, coming off the success of their fourth album, which garnered two hit singles and heavy exposure on MTV, the Red Hot Chili Peppers were on a roll. They changed record companies from EMI to Warner Brothers, and once again, went after Beastie Boys producer Rick Rubin to produce their next album. This time, 
he agreed. Even if the chili peppers weren't fully cleaned and pressed and professional, by the time they came back in to see Rick Rubin, they were certainly in a different place in their lives with a sense of what it is to go really try to make a record. From the beginning, Rubin made it clear that he wanted to approach this album differently. Rather than take the band to a recording studio, Rubin rented a four-story stone mansion in Laurel Canyon and turned it into a studio. Once he had it wired for sound, they all moved in for the next eight weeks to record the album. These guys don't work the regular way that bands work. They don't work on a clock where they punch in and do their thing and come in with a, a bunch of songs that are already written and are ready to go. And I think what he felt he needed was to build something that kept them physically together, kept them focused and thinking about the project and enabled them to work whenever and wherever they wanted. The arrangement fit the Pepper's style of writing and recording perfectly. There is a certain way that they record. There is a certain way most of the time that they write. The three musicians, John and Flea and, and Chad, will all jam and start to get some ideas together, develop those into melodies. Anthony takes that, then he goes off and writes. He comes up with lyrics. And producer Rick Rubin did more than just record what the band came up with. He became an important part of the writing process, too. He encouraged Anthony to write the song that would be his most personal to date, Under the Bridge. Rick Rubin had seen some poetry or some lines or something that Anthony had written about the bridge and about that place. And it was Rick who said, you need to make a song out of that. Under the Bridge would become the Peppers' biggest selling single of all time making it all the way to number two on the Billboard charts. Under the Bridge is about a place in L.A. where Anthony would go in the, you know, in the depths of his addiction to score his drugs and use his drugs. That was mostly populated by the homeless and by the people really at the, at the far end of bleakness in life. When the album called Blood Sugar Sex Magic was released on October 16, 1991, it shot up the charts, making it all the way to number three and eventually selling over 12 million copies worldwide. For me, Blood Sugar Sex Magic is the album that put them on the map. Absolutely, it was the album that was their breakthrough record. It was a record that uh, I think every kid in America knew who the Red Hot Chili Peppers were after Blood Sugar Sex Magic. The band that had started as a punk funk novelty act had become one of the biggest bands in the world, one that proved it was just as comfortable with acoustic guitar chords as it was with blistering bass lines. John Frusciante, they had a more diverse bag of guitar styles to choose from that really helped to open up that palette. It wasn't the first album that Frusciante played on because he played on Mother's Milk, but it was the album where he first really settled in and you started to see his influence musically with things like Breaking the Girl, I, I Could Have Lied, Under the Bridge, that softer side of the Red Hot Chili Peppers became really evident. The subsequent tour put them in front of millions of their new fans, and the opening acts would end up reading like a who's who of 90s alt rock. Chicago's Smashing Pumpkins, Pearl Jam, and another up and coming West Coast grunge band called Nirvana shared the bill with the Peppers at auditoriums and arenas from coast to coast. The year ended with a two night stand at the LA Sports Arena, where the Peppers Nirvana show was joined by Fishbone. When we all got together, when Fishbone and the Chili Peppers got together, man, it was just all fun. It was fun and creativity. Fun and creativity, man, and camaraderie and, and friendship. The overseas leg of the tour, however, would be anything but fun for one of the Chili Peppers. And before they returned to California, their world would be turned upside down. As the Red Hot Chili Peppers approached the second half of their 92 world tour, the pressures of being a rock star had begun to weigh heavily on the band's gifted young guitarist, John Frusciante. Not only that, he had begun experimenting with the band's traditional drug of choice, heroin. Anthony Kiedis, now clean and sober for three years and having lost his best friend to the drug, was not in a forgiving mood. The two clashed regularly. Now here's John Frusciante, the guy that's taking Hillel's place, that's going, I'm gonna go dance on these coals over here. 
As the situation with Frusciante continued to get out of hand, friends pressed Fishbone bassist Norwood Fisher to talk to him. And they called me up to say, you're the only person that can talk him out of this, Norwood. Please talk to him, talk him out of this. And, you know, maybe the most thing that I could say is like, dude, if you die, I'm not coming to your funeral. I'm like, after Hillel, I was like, like I don't really want to go to any more junkie funerals. Before a show in Tokyo on May 7th, John Frusciante told the band he was quitting and going home. The rest of the tour, including two more Japanese dates and the entire Australian leg, was cancelled. John was not in a good place with his own substance use and in his own head, and I think he just was exhausted and not taking care of himself and didn't want to be there. The following month, when the Peppers appeared in a revealing photo on the cover of Rolling Stone magazine, Frusciante had been digitally removed. He was about to go to press. John quit the band. We had to call the cover back, strip John off the cover. Anthony, Flea, and Chad returned to L.A. to lick their wounds. John Frusciante simply disappeared, just as he had from the magazine cover. Touring the world in a way that they hadn't really done before did take a real toll after the big success of Blood Sugar Sex Magic. Flea became exhausted and later was diagnosed with chronic fatigue syndrome. I think the band as a whole felt kind of spent. The Chili Peppers were once again down and out. The question was, how could they get back up? In the fall of 1992, the Red Hot Chili Peppers again found themselves one guitar player short of a band. John Frusciante, whose vibrant, freewheeling playing style and songwriting had helped make the band one of the most popular in the world, had quit and disappeared into a drug-filled haze. With Frusciante, they could do different things. It didn't just have to be fast, funk, crazy grooves. They could do beautiful songs. The Peppers didn't just need a guitar player. They needed an amazing guitar player. And they had one in mind. Former Jane's Addiction guitarist, Dave Navarro. Dave Navarro was known for his virtuosic playing and creating a real um, atmospheric type of guitar playing that kind of swirled around the music a lot. But when the Peppers asked him to join the band, he turned them down. You know, I was obviously very flattered and, and knew those guys for many, many years. I just, I happened to be in the process of recording an album with the bass player of Jane's Addiction, Eric Avery, and it was inappropriate for me to jump ship at that time and then, you know, leave him high and dry and then go on a world tour of the Chili Peppers. The band enlisted the help of veteran L.A. rock guitarist Eric Marshall to finish the tour. The shows went well, but the band didn't feel the chemistry was right, so Marshall was out. Frustrated, they tried Navarro again. Flea and I had gotten together and jammed over at Stephen Perkins' house, and uh, Henry Rollins was singing, so we had like this impromptu jam that was basically out of the love of music and the love of jamming, and, and I connected with Flea so amazingly well in that session. This time, free of other commitments, Navarro agreed to join the band. Dave Navarro is a, is a star. I mean, he carries himself like a star. He looks like a star. And it all just seemed so like if all of a sudden Keith Richards was sitting in with The Who on, on tour. These two enormous bands within that alt-rock community that sort of overnight had this, you know, superstar melding. To celebrate Navarro joining the band, the Peppers all bought new Harleys and headed off to Hawaii to hang out and write new songs. We shipped our bikes to Hawaii and all our instruments and uh, basically spent a month to two months riding around the island, getting to know each other, which was really important. I think anybody who was welcomed into the fold had to be a, a friend that could mesh with them out of the recording studio as well as in. So that, that was a really key period for them to kind of feel like, well, Dave is one of us and uh, we can do something bigger together. It may have sounded idyllic, but almost as soon as the Harleys rolled out of the packing crates, there were problems. For starters, lead singer Anthony Kiedis was back to using heroin. You know, I remember being out in Hawaii getting ready to, to write with those guys and Anthony was just gone, like didn't show up. And weeks later, when they got back to L.A., things only got worse. Anthony was, you know, a different kind of, of addict. You know, he would lock himself up in a hotel. 
and disappear for weeks on end. Anthony wasn't like, let's go to the Four Seasons and get high. He would be in some like up downtown grungy flea bag hotel. In July of 1994, when the band got together to record their next album, they were not in a good place, mentally or emotionally. It would be a lot easier story if it were then they lived happily ever after and everything was great from there, but of course it wasn't. And they still had the same demons. The record started slowly coming together, but things were not gelling like they had on the last two albums. I think the guys at the time really missed John because they'd seen how the band had just blossomed on Blood Sugar Sex Magic creatively. After a month in the studio, the band gave their first live performance together at Woodstock Music Festival. They did it with typical Chili Peppers flair, performing part of their set in giant light bulb costumes. In the studio, however, things were anything but typical. The band was struggling with the high expectations created by the success of their last album. But I think that all of us were feeling the pressure at the time, and it was, you know, it was really difficult because here I am coming from a totally different musical place. These guys have to follow up their biggest record ever. You know, our singer is in and out of, of working with us. On September 12th, 1995, the band released One Hot Minute. By most accounts, it was a disappointment. It was not a well-received record. It was not a very successful record. It was not a record they were very proud of. And when the band hit the road to promote it, the fans were not afraid to show their disapproval of the new lineup. I remember being at shows and, and playing and looking out at the audience, and people would have signs like, where's John? And they're yelling at me like, bring back John. And I'm like, dude, don't get mad at me. I mean, they would get mad at me. Toward the end of 1996, drummer Chad Smith broke his wrist and the tour was indefinitely postponed. The band decided to lay low and try to regroup. Little did they know how much regrouping was to come. Sexta, corra e garanta seu lugar no sofá. Tem Slash ao vivo no Multishow. O ex-guitarrista do Guns N' Roses não vai deixar ninguém parado no show que rola no Rio de Janeiro. Slash, nesta sexta, nove e meia da noite, ao vivo, na TV e na web. Assine o pacote Família da Claro TV e adicione mais 32 canais à sua programação. Isso mesmo, mais 32 canais. Ligue 10699 e assine já. São mais 7 canais de filmes e séries, mais 2 canais de esportes, mais 17 canais de variedades e mais 6 canais infantis. Ao todo, são 135 canais para você e sua família. Ligue 10699 e peça já o seu pacote Família. para todos os brasileiros. At the start of 1997, the Red Hot Chili Peppers were taking a little time off to get themselves together after the disappointing release of their sixth studio album, One Hot Minute. While frontman Anthony Kiedis took off for India to try to get clean once and for all, Flea joined Dave Navarro for a Jane's Addiction reunion tour. Meanwhile, former Peppers guitarist John Frusciante had slipped into a drug-addicted haze. He didn't leave his room. He didn't open the windows. His teeth fell out. I mean, it's every worst, chunky, cliche nightmare in your head. That is what Frusciante was living. 
In the summer of 97, Fishbone lead singer Angelo Moore got a call from John. He sounded bad. He said, man, the black people are in my paintings, Angelo, and you need to come up here and talk to me. I said, what'd you say? He said, the black people are in my paintings, and I need for you to come talk to me, Angelo, because only you'll understand. Sounded like he was trapped in something because he was whispering that. Angelo rushed over to his house. John Vachante was covered in paint from head to toe, paint up his nose and his mouth and in his eyelids. All over the floor, paintings all over the wall, cassette tapes all torn up and ripped out everywhere. So I stayed in the house with him. I was a little scared, but I'm like, well, I'm not going to leave here because this is my friend. Trishante was completely broke, having sold all his guitars and given away his last $2,000 to a cab driver. Flea helped check him into rehab. The doctor said it was a miracle that a, a cartilage in his bones and a calcium, the, the lack, everything that had come out of his body, they were, they were absolutely perplexed that he was still alive. It was an absolute miracle that he was still breathing. Frushante slowly began to get clean and nurse himself back to health. At the same time, the band's current guitarist was heading in the opposite direction. After the Jane's Addiction 97 tour, I ended up getting loaded again and, and started shooting drugs again. And uh, when Chili Pepper rehearsal started up, I brought it around them. And it was certainly not a strong move on my part. Having gone through the twin nightmares of Slovak and Frusciante, the Peppers fired Dave Navarro. At the time, I could only view this as completely hypocritical, but it wasn't working anyway, you know? So what better time? Like, if it's not working now, add heroin and cocaine, it's for sure not going to work. Navarro eventually got clean and remains friends with the band today. Looking back on my time there, you know, I have absolutely no regrets joining the band. I mean, it was actually a pretty amazing experience, you know. I was all of a sudden catapulted into this next level of touring entertainment. I, I have made really amazing friends. With the departure of Navarro, once again, the Peppers found themselves in need of a guitar player. I think the guitar seat was like the exploding chair and spinal tap. But this time, the auditioning process would be short. John Frusciante was now out of rehab and living in a small apartment in L.A. Flea approached him about coming back to the band. Frusciante was still a long way from recovered, but he agreed to give it a try. John was still just physically weak. He had come from a deep, dark hole and was just getting out of it and beginning to play again. By then, Anthony Kiedis had returned from India a new man. Drugs and seedy hotels had been replaced by health food and yoga mats. Anthony was getting to a place in his life where he was starting to look at some bigger questions than just, you know, one day to the next and one show to the next and one party to the next and was exploring a more spiritual sensibility. The band started rehearsing that spring, and by the end of the summer, the reconstituted Peppers entered the studio, again with Rick Rubin at the mixing board, to work on a new album. Rick really makes the guys work. He's the kind of guy Rick will, you know, have the guys work on a bunch of song ideas and go, all right, you see me 10, write 15, 20 more. That was, that was the start of, like, probably the most incredible week of recording that I've ever seen in my entire career. I think in a week, they recorded close to 30 songs, and they were just exploding. As the band continued to record, Frusciante only got stronger. Having John in the band was probably the key that actually broke the record, because he's He's just a, a wonderful melody writer and a wonderful background singer and a great guitar player and a beautiful soloist. On June 8, 1999, the Red Hot Chili Peppers' eighth album, Californication, hit the record stores. Californication was a very different record for the Chili Peppers. It was a quieter, it was a more introspective kind of a record. That audience that had grown up with them was, was older too. They weren't those same kids, and so stuff that was as contemplative as scar tissue did really resonate with their audience. 
it's a real triumphant return for the band. It was an incredible record. So it was good to have them back as that unit again. When the follow-up album, 2002's By The Way, met with even bigger success, there was no denying that the Red Hot Chili Peppers had managed to come back from the dead again. They are the band that they have always wanted to be. And Chad, Flea, and John Fushante are communicating on such a high level right now. They always had a great way of communicating musically, but they have raised the stakes. For decades, they've been fighting, competing in, out, and at this point, it just felt like all of the energy between them and everything that they were expressing was just so up and so positive. You know, the, the best is yet to come. The whole sex, drugs, and rock and roll thing may sound cliche, but the way that they've been able to make it become a part of their existence and their music, and just the fact that they've come out on the other end of it stronger than ever, I think that's an incredible story in itself. At the beginning of 2008, after winning five Grammy Awards for their most recent album, Stadium Arcadium, the Chili Peppers announced they were going to take some time off, this time on their own terms. You know, they're not 23 anymore. They have families, they have lives, they have babies. If you're going to keep going, you need to know when to put the brakes on a little bit. But nobody has any doubt they'll be back. The bounty of life is, is infinite, you know, and, and so is music. They have been through depths and highs and lows and very high highs and very low lows. And I think once you see that you can get through that and, you know, you've won some battle scars together, I think that the bond that comes at that point doesn't easily go away.